Okay. So hi everyone and good morning. So I am um, uh, in this session. I'm going to talk to, to you about uh, thinking simply. Um, this thinking simply uh, without losing performance has been a very good thing for me. Uh, however, it may not be a good thing for you. So, uh, you know, uh, you may want to listen to what I have to say and see if it applies to you. Um, and you may want to adapt uh, the entire simplistic thinking or parts of it. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to share my screen. Move into the presentation. Just give me a minute. Okay. So can you see my presentation here? Yeah. Okay, so I want to spend a few minutes on the safe meat beat thinking. And uh, the question that can you use mutual funds to meet your return goals consistent with your risk appetite? Right? So if you say, said that there was nothing else that you invested in. Uh, could you meet your goals uh, with just mutual funds? So some people, because they are very risk averse and because they just understand this and they are like relatively older, uh, you know, just use a combination of fixed deposits and savings accounts and they use nothing else, right? And whatever goals they have, they kind of meet them, right? Like, because they don't run out of money. So uh, now things have evolved. So you don't need to be stuck with just fixed deposits. Um, but you don't also need to get into a huge amount of diversification like PMS, AIF, um, crypto, uh, all kinds of things. Okay. So that is really the question that we are going to try and answer and also illustrate this concept of what is safe meat, meat thinking. So any questions on um, what the overall purpose of this um, discussion is? No, I'm good. Okay. Madhuri, Anita, anything from your end? No, I presume not. Okay, so let's move forward. Okay. So, um, so the simple seven fund portfolio I, I, with a 20, 64, 16, actually there's a bit of a thing because I changed the earlier we had, what is the Bharosa bundle, which had three funds, which tried to mimic the Nifty 500 because um, when Bharosa had analyzed this, uh, the, uh, you know, the Nifty 500 cost or expense ratio was a little high and they felt that this three fund thing might be better than just having just the Moti Lalo Swal Nifty 500. So um, it's actually a five fund portfolio because I, just to make it simple and to uh, illustrate the 20, 64, 16, and because this is just a starting point, it is not a recommendation. It's not a model portfolio and nothing in this uh, discussion is intended as advice for you to act on. So you can just use this as a starting point and act on this um, after doing your own analysis, either on your own or with your advisor. Okay. So what we are saying is that if you had a very simple five fund portfolio, and the five funds are listed here. Okay. I've got, I had got a lot of requests of saying, what are these funds? I said, you have to wait for the talk and I'll reveal the funds in the talk. So, uh, you know, here are the, um, the funds. So the first one is this Nippon India Arbitrage Fund, uh, which is the safe component. Uh, then the Motilal Oswal Nifty 500, uh, which is uh, the meat component. 
So as you can see, 84% of this portfolio, the 2064, is in these two funds. And 16%, which is allocated 8% to mid cap and 4% to small cap and 4% to something called the Motilal S&P BSC Enhanced Value Index thing, 4%. Uh, and the last one is something which is called factor investing. So while it's an investing fund, uh, index fund, it doesn't, um, it constructs the stocks that it's going to invest in uh, using factor investing. Okay. So these are the five funds. But before I go into just the funds and how it's performed and so on and so forth, I want to uh, talk a little bit about what is this safe meat beat thinking. Okay. Um, okay. So, and then I'll pause a little bit there uh, on each component. So in safe, uh, you know, some people consider gold as safe. They consider real estate as safe. Uh, okay. But that to me is not safe. Because if you look at gold, it's been quite volatile. It's gone up and down. There have been periods of high returns, periods of low returns. Real estate also, there have been periods where uh, real estate has gone down for a fairly long time. And then uh, in some times it's given spectacular returns. So it's definitely not safe, right? So what do we consider safe? So we consider things like public provident fund safe, maybe some national saving schemes safe, fixed deposits safe. Um, you know, if you uh, have these terrible insurance come investment products, uh, you know, some of them may be safe, uh, right? So though that is what you have as safe, right? Um, and uh, you may choose to uh, keep very little safe. That's entirely up to you. But as a starting point, we recommend that keep at least 20 safe. We have seen portfolios where people have 100% safe, right? And we have seen portfolios where people have 0% safe, right? So where you end up in safe is up to you. So one, you need to understand the concept of safe and then decide what is right for you in terms of percentage in your safe. And this is not your mutual fund portfolio, but your overall wealth, right? So any questions on this concept of safe and what essentially... Um, the percentage should be, and why is it 20% as the starting point? No, it's quite clear. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let me just elaborate on the why 20% a little bit, right? So the safe part of your portfolio, as you'll see later, uh, gives the lowest return. Like, so the Nippon India Arbitrage Fund essentially gives somewhere between a 6 to 7% return. Okay. Uh, it has very good taxation. Like, so if you sell it, you get equity taxation. Uh, so compared to other debt type of instruments, uh, it is uh, what we are talking about, uh, a good starting point in our safe bucket. And if our safe bucket had only this fund, we would be quite happy. Right. Now, why 20% is that if you believe in the India growth story, uh, having more and more allocated to the growth story, which covers both inflation and growth, uh, makes sense. So why not 100%? So many things can happen. You can lose your job and you know need money while you're trying to find a new one. You may decide that uh, if you're a woman, um, you know, you want to take some time off to raise a family, um, in which case you need some money uh, while you're doing that. Um, if, you know, so whatever your circumstances, there may be issues where uh, there are some unforeseen events, emergencies, etc., for which you need to have safe money. Now, you could use a withdrawal from your uh, risky money. Uh, but the problem is because that money is risky, uh, when, at the time when you withdraw, that money may be down a lot. 
right? And, and then you'll be forced to withdraw and book your losses. So that is a scenario you want to avoid. The second reason is that you also want to possibly have some dry gunpowder because if the markets drop or you have uh, some great opportunity, right? Your friend startup, your own startup, uh, your, uh, you have a distressed real estate opportunity where somebody needs to sell and you have money and you're ready to buy, right? So for that, you need uh, this save money, right? So here I'm talking about relatively large portfolios, <laughs> but even there. So if you have, say, a 100 crore portfolio, then 20 crores will be safe, right? And you may say, why do I need 20 crores safe? But even there, we are saying, hey, you might want to keep 20 crores safe. Because there's also a concept of the marginal utility of money. Right? Wherein if you um, had put say only 10 crores as safe, then your 90 crores would have grown more and given you probably a few other crores. But after 100 crores, every crore has less marginal utility. Right? And if you ha had that safe thing, it helps you sleep well at night. You know, whatever happens, you know, Iran attacks Israel, whatever, <laughs> you don't bother because your portfolio is insulated. At least your 20 crores is there. Right? So that is the reason for the safe. Then buy the uh, 64 in meat. So meat is like trying to meet the market, which is the Nifty 500, uh, as what we have defined in India. So uh, these, uh, so essentially you've got 80 left and 80% of that is 64. So 80% 80 of 80% is 64%. So that's how the 64 number comes. And the 16, which is left, is where you're trying to beat the market. That is why that most of us have a gambling instinct, right? We ask the question saying, why shouldn't I buy a lottery ticket? We know that the odds of our winning the lottery are like very remote. And that's why the lottery, that's how the lottery runs. But we feel that somebody is going to win that lottery, you know, so that somebody could be me, right? So there is this whole thing about trying to gamble uh, whether it's Dream 11, fantasy teams, cricket, crypto, um, you know, and in certain cases, you might be very good at it, right? So, like, it could be day trading, it could be uh, whatever it is um, in there. But in the context of mutual funds, what we are saying is that if you put 16% into these are our three picks, which we've actually got from Explore using Explore funds on Brosa. So one of the things that at least I find very useful, and I want anyone who watches this video to think about, is to uh, become a member of Brosa, try it out, and see if it is good for you. And if it's good for you, continue after the free trial, uh, and use things like the investing playground, the Explore funds, and so on and so forth, uh, to be able to provoke your thinking, or, and or the thinking of your advisor to see what kind of thing works best for you. Okay. So I'm going to pause here again and see if there are any questions on this 2064-16. Uh, could you briefly elaborate on what the profiles of these funds are? You know, if we have to, uh, you know, arrive at this ourselves, you know, by looking at uh, the playground. Uh, what are we looking for in these yeah. different buckets? Right. So the first two are kind of obvious. I mean, so I won't spend much time on those, uh, like the arbitrage fund and the thing. So, but if you go into the arbitrage fund, like someone told you that this arbitrage fund is a very good safe fund. Right. Now you could look at it on Explore and see, yeah, well, no, Explore actually doesn't cover debt funds. So uh, you can't use Barosa Explore, but you can go to Money Control and you can look at this and see what its performance has been over very long periods. 
how does it actually operate right because it buys in the spot market sells in the forward market or the other way around and looks for arbitrage opportunities uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's why its returns are pretty consistent and safe and uh, the taxation is treated as equity taxation so you can kind of understand a little bit of the basics uh, then you can look at the exit load uh, of the fund saying okay uh, how long if i if this doesn't turn out well can i move um, and if that's easy then you don't need to do too much of an exercise uh, you know uh, because you can end up confusing yourself and you don't want to do a phd on arbitrage funds right so um, then you just say fine i understand what i need to understand it looks okay i'll go into it maybe there's some risks i didn't figure or don't know about if that happens i'll exit kind of thing right uh, so that's the arbitrage fund the nifty 500 is an index fund okay so it basically invests in all the 500 stocks which constitute the index uh, and these are the top things and it's weighted by market capitalization uh, so uh, if a particular company like say this Paytm was part of the uh, nifty 500 right uh, and it had a certain weight based on its market capitalization now Paytm went down quite a bit right after this uh, rbi regulation strictures against them etc so what would happen in that case is that PTM's weightage would fall, right? So this index fund would sell a, some small amount of PTM and keep selling till so that its const, uh, uh, weight in the index uh, gets properly represented. So while the index fund is called a passive fund, it's like a duck, you know, on a pond where you look, the duck is very serene, it's floating on the pond, but under the thing, it's moving its feet vigorously, right, to uh, do this whole thing, right? So uh, under the covers, the index fund, there's a constant churning, but you don't have to buy, sell, you don't have to make those decisions, and you don't have to pay tax, which is the great advantage of having these index funds. So some of the people, when they invest in index funds, have this FOMO concept, you know, like, oh, wow, this Titagar wagons, you know, they had like a 434% uh, gain in one year. Now, if I could have identified Titagar wagons, uh, then I would have had this 434%. So why don't I look at trying to get all these tips from all of these kind of people and like try and apply my brains that okay railways are going to make more trains and therefore they're going to need more wagons and you know therefore you know but you don't know i mean because this information is there with everybody right is it there in the price is it fairly valued are you getting in at the top right is there going to be more competition etc and this is what the index tracks passively right so if theta guard wagons delivers an extra performance, it will buy more Tita bags. If it tanks, it will sell Tita bags. Right? And an active fund manager will do this actively. Right? It In terms of that. So, it's like, you know, why are you trying to uh, play, say, golf as an amateur and try to beat a pro? Right? Uh, so, it's like you playing chess and trying to beat a top computer programmer who programmed chess bot, right? Chances are you won't. Or you're trying to beat a grandmaster, you know, like an active fund manager. It's a good one. The chances are you won't, right? So that is the Nifty 500. Is this clear? Okay, then... The three funds that I have chosen uh, in my beat thing and why I've given half my allocation to mid cap. Now, this is just me. And like I said, this is just a starting point, right? I'm just trying to illustrate how you can think, right? So uh, I felt that, look, uh, you know, 
these companies which have not necessarily made it to the top but have made it to the middle may grow better than the large and the small on a risk weighted basis so let me put 50% in mid cap that was the first thought so then i started finding out okay like by mid cap fund so i can would go to uh with bharosa and see you know like where can i make a bet on mid cap and which funds and then try and narrow it down and i narrowed it down to this quant mid cap index fund and i'll show you as to you know, how what the explore looks like uh and then i did the same with small cap and then somebody told me that this uh, snp bse enhanced value is a good fund why don't you take a look at it uh so i looked at it i tried to read up on this factor investing and all um, and like again i didn't want to do a phd in that so uh it looked very good so i added it to my portfolio right so does that make it clear as to how you should proceed about trying to construct your own simple portfolio yeah thank you right okay moving on to the next one so what have been the results so the 2064-16 the performance over one year has been 39.12% and the performance over three years has been 21.14% and i'll show you how i got these numbers right so this is not shabby it's pretty good okay um in there now if you had put it in say a fixed deposit your performance over one year would have been 7% roughly and performance over three years would have been 6.5% whatever right and if you did it on an after tax basis then you would be even worse because if you liquidated then you would pay tax uh, right but this is all equity taxation and if you had held it over one year you would only pay 10% while if you liquidated your debt stuff you end up paying 35% right so clearly now what we are saying is that the simple portfolio is better than fixed deposits and i would argue it's better than real estate right so if you have investment properties you have land you have various things then you could consider selling those and investing into a simple portfolio because it gives you much more liquidity and stuff like that now we have gone even to the extreme of not owning a house and just paying rent right which i don't recommend to a lot of people because uh, that's uh, very uh, you know because most people like to own a home uh, you know so uh, that's the kind of thing so any questions here on the performance of this 2064-16 and how because the key point that i'm trying to bring across is and provoke your thinking is to see that however large your portfolio and it may be very complicated uh it's better to try and think and move in the direction of simplicity and by moving in that direction of simplicity you're not going to lose performance you might even gain performance and you will definitely gain simplicity which at some point when you are no more will help whoever is left behind right do you see any other downsides to simplicity or upsides upsides sir many you know it's just simple <laughs> yeah. you don't have to worry about too many things yeah. uh okay. i mean i don't see any downside Oh, okay. maybe you know we are missing out on some extraordinary, uh, you know, product or extraordinary return from from something a little more complex, but then it also takes away that much of time and effort, and you really don't know whether, you know, you can only judge that in hindsight. You know, it could have you could have very well invested in something really bad, <laughs> thinking it's really good. So. okay great so let's move on to now this is the complex part right so we are saying okay there is this great portfolio manager person he speaks very well he seems very knowledgeable he talks about you know how the price of oil is going to is determined by these five six factors and 
uh, you know, how he spent a lot of time and how that translates into how he's picked his portfolio and how he decides how which stocks to buy and which stocks to... And you feel, wow, you know, this person is like the next Warren Buffett. So I might as well uh, have, have, have him manage my money. Why am I trying to do all this simple portfolio, manage myself, etc. Right? So uh, to do a comparator... What I did was I removed the 20 in arbitrage, right? And I put 80 in meet the market and 20 in beat the market, right? And I saw what was the kind of return. So the return here was 47.16% in one year. And this number in brackets is 50.91, which is the uh, thing that uh, if you were a first quartile PMS provider, then you had to make a return of 50.91% last year to reach the first quartile. So in other words, 75% of the PMS providers made returns less than 50.91. And while 47.16 is less than 50.91, it's pretty close. So I would think that at least 70% of the EMS providers made a return worse than ours comparator, right? This is how you could read this, uh, these numbers. Does that make sense? Right? And then in the three year, it becomes even worse for the PMS because there the number is 24.919 and 24.5. So that means we definitely beat 75%, no question, right? Because 24.5 is greater than 24.9 and maybe we beat four or 5% more. So, right. And I think the longer you go, right, you will see that this becomes even more tough for the PMS people to beat, right? Now with... EIF and all, it's like really difficult to compare anything. So, uh, because there you're locked in, you can't get out, right? And there are many qualitative things as to why you may not want to uh, be in a PMS EIF kind of. Okay, so with this, um, I'm going to... So, nobody has a crystal ball. What is right for you, you have to decide. This is just a decision model to help you choose. So suppose you look at your PMS and say that I got 34% return from my PMS after all fees last year. Is that good or bad? Because this was a question, a real question that someone asked me. Okay. And I said, well, you know, I don't know, right? Like I have to compare it. And that actually led me to develop this comparison thing. So if we go back now, now we got a simple answer um, saying here that no, it wasn't good because, you know, a simple thing would have given you 47%, right? So now we are kind of um, well armed with this kind of stuff, right? So with that, I'm going to stop, but I want to show you a few more slides where these numbers came from, what the Explore Funds is, what this, uh, you know, where I got these numbers and stuff like that. So I'm going to move on to that. But before I do that, any questions? No, you're good? Okay. So now let's move on to this thing on the Excel. So if I go into one year, so these are the funds, right? The Nippon Arbitrage, the Moti Loswal Nifty 50, the 20%, 64%, the Quant Mid Cap with the 8%, the Quant Small Cap with the 4%, the MOSN, the BSE Enhanced Value. And I got the returns partly from money control for the Nippon Arbitrage, okay? And for the others, I got it from Harosa Explore, right? And I plugged it in. And that's how I got this 39.12% number, right? Which is there in the um, PowerPoint 39.12, right? 
so and the PMS comparator was 47.16, where I just removed the Nibbana arbitrage. The rest of the stuff is and put 80% in uh, this and the 20% here. So I put 10% in the mid cap, 5% and 5%. <laughs> now, what you can also see is that had I made this 70 30, then it would have looked even more, more bad for the PM. And I have a feeling that most of the PMS are not doing 80-20. They're actually doing 70-30 and some may be even doing, taking much more risk like a 50-50. You know, then you see what these numbers are, right? You can play around and see, right? Now in the three year, I had a little bit of a problem in, in the sense that um, that BSC enhanced value, right, didn't have a three year track record. So I removed that, right, because here, if you look at it, look at the one year return of BSC enhanced value 92.5%. Right. So uh, I removed that and allocated it to the small and mid cap type thing. And then I got the 21.14 and 24.5%. Right? Now I'll come back to this Excel uh, because I want to discuss this over under thing, but that's the last thing. So I'll uh, go now to uh, this explore funds. Okay, so before I go to explore funds, let me just show you where I got these uh, numbers of what is the 75% and all that kind of stuff. So this is the um, sheet called the APMI, the Association of Portfolio Managers in India, right? And if I go to reports and I take the consolidated IA performance report, that's what I've done and I've gone into equity. And then I said the PMS provider name, and here I've chosen a pretty good one, Bellwether uh, and their approach, long-term growth. And as of March, 2024, and this is the data. So in one year, if you look at this TWRR percentage, the first quartile is 50.91, right? And if you look at my presentation, and so 50.91 and three years is 24.19, right? So, um, so this particular um, fund had 59.37 and 23.47 in three years, right? Uh, but the quartile pieces were this. So in our presentation, we had said these bracketed figures, 50.91 and 24.19. This is where it comes from, right? And so if you really look at this bellwether type of thing and all that, right? Then uh, bellwether did better in one year, but not so good in three years. Okay, mm, so that is this one. Now let's go to the explore funds piece. And this actually, this explore fund is something that I like personally a lot in Marosa because it helps me compare things, right? So here you have quant small cap, you have quant mid cap, and you have this S&P BSE enhanced value, and you have the Mutila Loswal Nifty 500, right? So in a five-year period, uh, the Quan small cap has been the best, but these two don't have values. In three years also, this has been the kind of thing, but this particular fund, the Motilal Oswal, doesn't have a value. Right? 
And then you can look at the one year thing. Look, so this is where I'd pull the, the numbers for what I fed into the Excel. Right? So you can see that, you know, this enhanced value, now it hasn't, like, while three months, it's still the top, but it's showing some signs of uh, some problems. So it's worth watching. Uh, it's 1.8% while these are 3.8 and 6.7 and 2.8 type of thing, right? Um, so you can play around with this Explore funds and this can really help you to find items that you may want to invest in, to track items that you have invested in already and so on and so forth, right? So any questions on this Explore funds? Um, the APMI stuff that I showed you, et cetera. I'm just uh, guessing when we see something like this, Motila Lowe's Fund S&P BSC enhanced value, one month performance at 1.8%. Uh, we, we obviously don't have to be alarmed and we don't have to be looking at it on a month on month basis, right? Because, mm -hmm. because you know, that's the whole point of having a simple portfolio. You don't really look at it yeah. so regularly that you are worried about these small blips or seemingly small blips. So when should we kind of get alarmed or saying, okay, I need to act on it? Yeah. So this is something that I think this Barosa is working on uh, where it'll kind of send you a notification saying, hey, you know, you might want to look at this. Right now, there are two kinds of things. One is that uh, has it been underperforming its benchmark? So here, if I click this highlight gaps to benchmarks button, then you'll see that uh, it's slightly underperforming 1.8 versus 2, 17 versus 17.5, etc. Uh, so yeah, it might highlight it to you if it meets its. Uh, oh, okay, I need to, because the idea is that you don't want to highlight something to a person if they don't need to worry about it, right? Um, uh, or it could be you think that, okay, this is in your beat category and uh, the rest of the things in the beat category are kind of doing this and therefore its uh, performance is not all that good, right? Uh, and then... There's also this question now. The nice thing about this Motila Lowe's well, SNP BSA enhanced value is that it doesn't have an exit rule. Right? So after 15 days or something, you can get out of it. Right? So you could get out of it and put it in someone else if you got really spooked. But my thing is that you should not look at things more than once a year after you've got it. Right? Okay. Um, anything else? Otherwise, I, just I, I, I don't think there's any harm in looking at it, but I think um, I, I would give anything a year to to truly tell me it's doing well or not doing well. Yeah. So it's this whole thing of you know when you buy something like say suppose you bought this S and P BSC enhanced value. For most people, they may just say okay, like I've because, you know, fine, someone told me, buy it, it looked good, blah. But otherwise, once you bought it, you, and if you have very few funds, you can actually look at their portfolio. Because you can go to money control and you can look at Motila Loswal, S&P, BSE, Enhanced Values portfolio. And once a month or something, you can look at what are the changes that they are making. Do you agree with this? Now, it so happens here that this fund buys... Uh, what stocks that it con considers undervalued based on three factors like the price to book value, the price to earnings ratio, and things like revenue growth and all that kind of stuff. Right. So it has some methodology that it follows. Now it so happens that it this methodology has spit out um, stocks which are much more PSU in nature, which is why it has this huge performance. Right. Now you can see how often does it rebalance uh, the index and all that kind of stuff if you really want to get into it. So then 
you did a fair amount of analysis when you bought it. So there is this thing of buy carefully. Now, if you understand what you bought, then it's very easy to think that, okay, is this a temporary downturn? Do I want to continue to hold it? So sell reluctantly. So buy carefully, sell reluctantly. Right? That's the kind of thing. Okay. I, th I, I, I think uh, in the beat category, so th there's very good reason for the safe category. There's very good reason for the meat category, right? You're trying to keep pace with the growth of the nation is the meat category. And the nation being defined in this case as Nifty 500. In the beat category, I think you need to have certain convictions that you want to execute and you should execute them in a small part of your money right? Uh, unless you have very, very strong convictions, in which case the part of the money you want to allocate to the beat category may be larger, but um, the beat category should be, in my opinion, at least for myself, something where, okay, I have certain convictions about the future. Like, let's say uh, I heard the budget speech and now I believe that a lot of money is going to be spent on infrastructure. Therefore, I want mm -hmm. to bet on the infrastructure sector and then I choose the funds but you know with a limited amount of money so that you don't stress yourself out over this and you're trying to bet on something and yes your bet may work out for you or it may not work out for you right you may have been wrong so yeah. but if it's a small portion in this case Sanjay's taken 20 percent but you know it, it could be less it could be zero for someone who says, look, I'm happy with keeping pace with the growth of the nation without trying to beat. Right. But, you know, I, I think since Sanjay's whole presentation is around PMS, uh, then typically people who go into PMS are looking to beat. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, Anita has made some great points. Uh, and uh, I think uh, one thing that you could also consider there in addition to uh, the points that she has made is, um, you know, like, uh, what is it that you're trying to do with your portfolio? Because even if you listen to the budget speech and infrastructure and all that, remember that your index funds also will reflect that. Right? If infrastructure stocks go up, the index people will buy it, right? also. So here, when you're doing the bets part of it, you're just trying to enhance that. Right? You're not just happy with a little bit of peace, but you're trying to say, no, no, I want to take a much more defined bet right? on a particular sector or a category or uh, index construction or whatever it is. Okay. Okay. I think let's not belabor that point. Uh, I think we've discussed it enough. So let's move on to the last piece of this presentation. Um, so um, this slide is probably very important because the question is that you have thousands of things to do. Why should you focus on this? So I'm going to give you some kind of numbers to get you to think about why it's important for you to focus. So I've just taken a relatively large portfolio of 10 crores. And the even if this person is 50, uh, right, then they still may live to 90. So I've taken 40 years as a tenor. The compounding gap I've taken 1%. So if this person, I've said, paid no attention to his portfolio uh, and did whatever, and he paid some attention and he made the compounding 1% uh, better. 1% is not at all a large number if you focus on all, because as you can see that, you know, making the right decisions here can make uh, a huge difference, uh, much more than 1%. But let's take 1%. Then, this over under calculation is basically taking your starting portfolio, uh, raising it by the compounding gap over the um, you know, 40 years, okay, and subtracting the original 
uh, amount that you started with. So the over under is five crores, right? And if you so the other thing is that you can also focus on reducing fees, right? Because the thing is that if you pay one percent extra fees, that also is approximately five crores, right? So spending some time understanding, you know, becoming your own advisor or paying a flat fee or whatever makes a lot of sense, right? Now, this calculation above <coughs> doesn't take into account the growth of the portfolio because this over-under will grow even more if your portfolio grows, right? So this is one piece. So you would almost title this, say, why care? Right? Why should I bother? Um, in there. Uh, and hopefully this gives you a answer as to why you should bother and focus on understanding this topic. Any questions on this, anyone? No questions? No questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay, cool. So now I've drawn a kind of list from more simple to less simple. So fixed deposits are more simple. Index active mutual funds becoming a little more complex. PMS more complex. Insurance plus investment even more complex. EIF real estate becomes even more complex. And then you have other things like crypto and all that which are even more complex. So this is more simple. This is less simple. Right, so you can see where on the spectrum of things do all your investments fall and where your simplicity versus complexity dynamic comes in. Okay, so you need to choose. Now, as you choose, you need to be mindful of fees and liquidity. Right, so the uh, adage that uh, you can be house rich and cash poor holds for quite a few people. Because you can be living in a home worth, say, 50 crores, right? But you can't eat your house, right? So if you need to spend, uh, say, 20,000 or 40,000 US dollars on a really nice trip, uh, travel thing, uh, you need to spend that <coughs> and you need liquidity for that. Right, the fact that you're living in a 50 crore house is not going to provide you that liquidity. Right, so you need to see what are the um, fees that you're paying if you're paying fees and what is the liquidity. Right, now there are the network effects of being part of a club. So if you have uh, you join a wealth management firm then you can network with other people who are part of this wealth management firm. Now, that might give you some business opportunities, some other opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. And there are network effects of being part of a club. So you can weigh that, right? Is that something that you really want to do? Uh, are you looking out for, you know, uh, being part of this networking club? Uh, is that club delivering for you, et cetera? Then, this remember Abhimanyu is a very uh, important thing. And Abhimanyu is a mythol mythological character who um, heard how, while still in the womb, how to get into the chakra view. Uh, but uh, he um, didn't hear how to get out. So in quite a few cases, it's very easy to get into the chakra view of complex stuff, but it is very difficult to get out. So uh, hopefully you're not falling into the Abhimanyu trap. And lastly, uh, though this may not be a very pleasant thing to think about, but uh, it is a reality uh, that after you're gone, who will manage all this that you have? Right? So these are some things that may help you uh, think about moving to simplicity or moving towards complexity, right? 
and it's much easier to move from simple to complex than from complex to simple. Like for us, it's for Nita and me, it has taken like well over a decade to move and simplify. Uh, and now I think we've reached a point where we are quite happy with the simplicity of our portfolio. Okay, any closing comments? Anyone? I'm going to stop the screen share. No, so Sanjay, this was very, very interesting and useful. And it gives a very nice uh, framework on deciding how do you, you know, why the standard allocation uh, ratios are, 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 sim are simple, but to look at what, what is underlying that, you know, what funds to choose and how to choose it. Um, as a broad framework is 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 very uh, interesting so thank you for that uh, just to add on i think yet another thing to think about which is not get carried away by smooth talking pms uh, you know <laughs> for, yeah. and just just be a little bit more discerning of uh, of what the realities are before actually putting our money into something. So definitely something really good to think about. Uh, very insightful as always. So thank you so much. Anita, anything? No, I think that's it. Uh, I think you guys covered everything. So Okay, one other thought I just want to... Was there anything in this which uh, you didn't expect and it sort of surprised you? Right? Like, was there any... Uh, thing in the numbers or anything else which kind of surprised you? Yeah, the numbers being so close, performance numbers of top tier, uh, top quartile uh, PMS uh, managers versus uh, the the index funds. Um, that being so close or the gap being so narrow between them was quite surprising. And and you when you highlighted that it was an 80-20 allocation rather than a 70 30 kind of an allocation uh it's actually quite shocking and it, it the question that comes to my mind is if if the and and if the average performance is so bad uh of these fund managers why are people still subscribing to their services uh i think that's more like madhuri's comment right? they're good sales people <laughs> <laughs> so there's all this and then uh, you know, maybe it's like, oh, oh, you don't do PMS. Oh, you know, like, it's like now you're at a... No, so it's, it's uh, I, I think it's, uh, one is how it's sold. It's sold like a special product for special people. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that's one thing, right? So you feel special when you belong to a special category. Um, and it's not like all PMSs are bad in the sense that like Sanjay showed you this bellwether thing, he took it as an example. Um, but I think where it becomes really hard for most people is really evaluating their stuff. I think that becomes a challenge because the taxes are not included, the fees are, and, and, and the benchmarks, the comparison with benchmarks. So all that becomes a little more complex because they will compare you with, let's say Nifty 50 but actually they will have taken you into some smaller stocks and stuff like that. So, but you know, I, I think this, this session is more for most people. Look, I don't think, you know, for some people, yes, if they like PMS, they should do it. But this whole, I think the objective of this session should be like for most people, don't go complex, just stay simple, you know? Yeah, because for me personally, after I did this whole thing, uh, exactly what Abhishek said. It was quite shocking to me that, um, and I don't even know whether these uh, numbers on that APMI thing, they are after fees and, uh, you know, all this taxes and other stuff. Um, you know, they, I'm pretty certain they're not after tax. And that is a fairly big deal because, you know, in PMS, you don't have a choice. You, they churn the portfolio for you and you will have to pay taxes. While here, you don't have to pay taxes. Right? 
Um, and uh, fees, it's probably after fees. So I, I, I would guess, uh, I would hope so at least. Uh, you know, so for a lot of these things, and like you know, with uh, this, the qualitative benefits of not being in a PMS is that you control your destiny. You want to move things from say uh, Nifty five hundred to uh, more like into beat or whatever you want to do. You can do it at a drop of a hat in a couple of days, right? In a PMS thing, you know, you don't know what the guy is doing, which is why I don't even like hybrid balance funds and all those kind of things. I'd like to do my own balancing, right? I like to be in control. You know, I, I don't want somebody else to be in control right? uh, of these kind of decisions, of what are my asset allocation decisions. Right? You can be in control about my funds, that, the stocks that I buy and all that, because that's too much work for me to do. Right, And if you're good at that, and that's your skill. Uh, but in terms of what is the correct asset allocation for me, right? are there lifestyle changes which have happened in my case? Am I able to take more risk or less risk? How do you know? Right, if you are a PMS manager, I know that. Right? So I should be able in control, na? not you. Right, okay. and earlier it was not possible to be in control. Now it is. So that is a, another big reason to avoid uh, PMS, unless you have a fabulous PMS manager. I think it also stems from the fear of the unknown, because yeah. most people are not formally trained on a lot of these things. Uh, it could be quite to even to get started. Uh, it could be quite uh, scary, <laughs> and uh, you know you would just naturally assume that if you have like a like professional dealing with this, that they would take their fiduciary responsibilities very seriously to maximize uh, your value. Uh, probably they are trying, but clearly the data does not reflect that. Uh, the the outcomes don't don't really show that you know they're acting in in the best of your interest so i think uh, learning about these things and to finally discover and realize that it's not as daunting and scary as 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 it seems when you begin uh, is is it's it's just something that all of us have to realize on our own through learning education uh, and, and of course, good advice. Uh, and this series has exactly been that good advice on how to look at it at a, at a meta level, at a framework level, how to think about, uh, you know, your portfolio, your money, uh, investments and things like that. So as always, Sanjay, this, this has been fantastic. Uh, I think we need more of these. <laughs> we, 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 we request you to think of topics like this uh, ever so often and 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 please invite us to to these uh, really interesting sessions yeah. thank you okay so i think we'll end on this note uh, that uh, because we are up to almost an hour um, so i think one of the things i hope that people have taken away from this thing is that if your pms provider says hey you you've got a great return right 35%. Most people will say, yeah, man, 35%, I'm very happy. But now you know that the same thing, did your PMS provider do badly or not? Right? Was this 35% good? Right? And at least you can ask that question. Right? Because what will also happen is that there will be a downturn. Right? Your PMS people are not magicians. Right? So they do really well in an up market. And then and they may not beat the market. But you're very happy with the 35% return. So you say, you remember that, oh, this guy gave me a 35%. Right? But when they have like a, say, minus 70% return, then... Also, they may be do, doing better than the market, right? So then they'll tell you, hey, you know, I did minus 17, but the market did minus 20. Right? So at that point in time, they'll bring the market in, right? Because they're good salespeople. So actually, I did plus three, right? So, so don't get fooled by this. 
okay uh, you know so if you have a person who is a pms provider who gives very good honest kind of annual reports feedback tells you what you know because one of the things that i use in the us is i use warren buffett and the returns have been okay but what i really like about the thing the annual letter i love reading it is the honesty the transparency the fact that he says that you know it's not me it's the american tailwind which has actually helped me deliver this kind of performance you know so that humility that thing about this thing and i'm very scared of people who say it's all me it's me it's me <laughs> you know so with that uh, thanks for attending the session and hopefully this is useful for you and uh, others and i'm going to stop the recording thank you very much